Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this is going to be on IR detectors and spatial resolution. Once again, my name is Desmond Lamont, the Director for Global Business Development for Teledyne's FLIR Research and Science Vertical. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to invite you to enter questions through the webinar portal. Uh, I'm going to try to answer these as time permits, uh, but rest assured, you're going to get an answer to your question, whether from me or your local field guy uh, or girl. So to provide context, uh, I'm going to briefly review the IR detector types again. Uh, then we're going to dive deeper on the topic of spatial resolution, which feels a little bit like an unintended pun, you know, diving deeper into spatial resolution. But I assure you, it is not intentional. <laughs> anyway, uh, after a uh, brief intro to the detector types, we're going to get into the topic of spatial resolution, what factors affect it, how it plays into typical thermal or infrared applications, et cetera. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun on this one, so buckle up and get ready to learn. As a reminder, this is just one of a five-part uh, webinar series covering the five things to know about IR detectors for research applications. Uh, all of these sessions, again, are going to be recorded and available uh, for on-demand viewing uh, via our website. Currently, sessions one and two covering topics of speed and sensitivity are available, so feel free to check those out and share them with any of your colleagues that may have also uh, and some interest in learning more about IR detectors for research and science applications. So IR detector types. Before talking about the hardware, let's just talk about the electromagnetic spectrum and where we fit in it. Uh, most of you are very familiar with the visible spectrum, which runs at a few hundred nanometer wavelengths, three, 400 or so, uh, up to about 900 nanometers or so. Uh, at FLIR, our cameras are going to typically operate in the infrared spectrum located at wavelengths longer than the visible spectrum, as you can see in the chart here. Uh, those who work in the infrared bands, uh, or as you get more experienced in the infrared world, uh, we're going to tend to always speak in terms of microns or micrometer waves, uh, with the infrared spectrum beginning at roughly one micron and true thermal bands beginning at about three micron, which I'll get into in just a minute. Uh, moving from left to right on the chart here, we have short wave, mid wave, and long wave infrared bands. Uh, now, every area or every group might define the specific bands uh, a little bit differently. So I'm just going to say at FLIR, you know, short wave for us is about 900 nanometers to 1.7 micron. Uh, due to its proximity to the visible spectrum, SWIR is going to be great for exploiting characteristics of material that you're familiar with in the visible spectrum, like being able to image or see through glass. Uh, alternatively, SWIR detectors can also do things that you aren't used to in the visible bands, like seeing through surface coatings, such as paint, to inspect the materials below, and imaging through atmospheric constraints like haze. Uh, another aspect of being close to the visible spectrum is that when you're in the 900 nanometer to 1.7 micron range, there's a high noise floor for any thermography applications because of all that reflected light. Uh, if you can even find a SWIR camera that's calibrated for thermography, uh, spoiler alert, FLIR SWIR camera can be calibrated for thermography. Um, while some of those can be calibrated for temperature measurement, they end up with a very high starting point of 400 Celsius uh, due to that noise floor. So you can use them for thermography applications, but because where you exist in the electromagnetic spectrum, it becomes a very high noise floor to climb above. And that's why we say that the true thermal bands are going to start at around 3 micron, where you can begin at about negative 20 C. And with that, we have the midwave infrared. Uh, midwave infrared is the standard range when it comes to most radiometry and high performance thermography applications. These detectors are exceptionally sensitive at typically uh, better than 20 millikelvin uh, NEDT. Uh, these detectors, you know, um, they're going to be great uh, for a lot of different applications. There's enough energy to adequately fill the uh, detector wells and run at frame rates of one kilohertz or greater at full frame. Uh, this is really the workhorse wave band for uh, cryo-cooled detectors. Uh, and finally, we have long wave infrared, uh, typically 7.5 to 14 micron. Uh, there are a few different detector technologies that address the long wave. Uh, it's also an interesting wave band because there are a lot of photons out there to leverage. Uh, this is going to enable better measurements of colder temperatures, uh, the use of cheaper detectors like uh, uncooled bolometers uh, that you find in nearly every handheld uh, infrared camera, and it allows for cryocooled options that achieve very short integration times in comparison to their more common mid-wave IR counterparts. Uh, another interesting feature of the long wave is that you experience fewer solar artifacts, so uh, reflections of the sun and glare. Uh, overall, 
Uh, all the wave bands are complementary to one another uh, for their unique capabilities or properties that's going to be found within each range of that spectrum. Now let's talk hardware. Uh, on the left side of the chart, you're going to see common examples of microbolometer based systems. Uh, these range from very small sensors like the FLIR Lepton on the bottom left to the more common handheld cameras I just mentioned used by many people for quick evaluation of a circuit, motor, other you know, relatively larger and slower target. Uh, those images are in the uh, center left. Uh, as we move to the right side of the screen, uh, these are going to be examples of cryocooled cameras. Uh, these are also called photon counters or quantum detectors. These systems are much higher performance and are typically the models of choice for engineers and scientists due to their flexibility, high speeds, greater sensitivity, and access to the raw data. Uh, cryocooled cameras, these also typically have smaller pixels and more lens options versus the bolometer op, uh, camera systems. And those aspects allow the cooled cameras to typically achieve a better spatial resolution than their bolometer uh, counterparts. I mentioned the two detector types, the bolometer and the cryocooled. These are uh, actually, there are actually uh, you know, quite a few detector uh, materials available for the cryocooled detector that you see here. These are going to range from uh, INSBI, which stands for indium antimonide, uh, to uh, MCT, which is uh, mercury cadmium telluride, to the strain layer super lattice, which is the SLS uh, acronym you see there, and so on. Uh, the good news is that the majority of applications have basically standardized on the use of uh, in-gas or indium gallium arsenide for shortwave infrared, uh, INSBI for midwave, and bolometers really are the most common for longwave applications. Uh, I will say that whether you're in the long wave or really any wave band, uh, choosing the right detector is really gonna depend on your specific application requirements uh, and having even basic knowledge about the differences between the, you know, the primary detector types you know, on the market like INSBI and, and microbolometers, they're really gonna assist you in identifying the most appropriate option for your given application. Uh, you know, we reviewed some additional core differences between the detector design and the speed and sensitivity webinars prior to this one. So be sure to check those out if you wanna learn more. Uh, as always, I recommend speaking with your local sales engineer to identify the uh, final configuration options to really optimize that for your capture. So let's talk about spatial resolution. When I think of spatial resolution, I can't help but think of this scene from the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. This is an 80s movie uh, where the cool kid skips class, uh, goes on a day of adventures with his friends, never gets in trouble for it. Classic 80s, right? Uh, at any rate, this is the scene where the kids go to the Art Institute of Chicago and Cameron, the character here in the red jersey, is uh, staring intently at a Seurat painting uh, called Sunday on La Grande Jatte. Uh, this art form is called pointillism. I know, all the facts you never thought you'd hear on a webinar from FLIR. <laughs> uh, this painting, it's made up of thousands of points of various colors, and at a typical distance, viewing distance of a few feet, uh, your eyes are gonna interpret the light bouncing off of each of those dots as a complete image, as you see here. Um, as you can see, Cameron, the character here, he's able to resolve the images and understand what's happening in the park. With that, he can make decisions based on the overall scene, as well as the figures and such within the painting. He can see the sailboats, that there's a steamship, there's a person with a white umbrella in the distance and so on. And he can even understand the scaling between the objects based on how they're put together. Uh, as he looks closer at the detail of the smaller features that you see here, he can even see the individual point sources of color and tell you which is which, though he is trading the greater view for the ability to see the individual dots. Uh, and that's really the core of, of spatial resolution and, and, and the trade-offs that you have here. Um, you know, as we move from the larger scene to the individual point sources, we improve our spatial resolution drastically, though there's that trade-off between the increased spatial resolution and our overall field of view. Uh, in general, you know, you've probably experienced this in a wide range of experiences. Uh, you've experienced it in experiences. Uh. <laughs> from uh, using a telescope uh, where it can be difficult to have enough spatial resolution uh, to determine any unique features of what you're seeing uh, at that distance to using a microscope where maybe the spatial resolution is so great that you're completely lost in terms of where on the uh, sample or unit under test that you're actually looking. So if we get down to a core definition of spatial resolution, uh, it's really, it's Spatial resolution, it can be called the instantaneous field of view or abbreviated as IFOV, uh, as well as the spot size 
uh, for the system. And it's really just the area that a single detector cell or pixel element images as it subtends out into space. It doesn't matter if it's a, a pixel element from a bolometer detector or a single unit cell from a photon counter, or even if we're talking about an off-the-shelf digital camera, uh, the concept is going to be the same. It's the area that that single pixel covers as it extends out into space. So let's get some definitions out of the way. Uh, when talking about spatial resolution, it's good to have a little grounding in the terminology associated with the imaging space. Uh, here you can see the camera and the video of a helicopter that it's imaging at some distance. Uh, as the total resolution uh, of the camera detector subtends out through the lens into space, we get a box or rather the field of view and it keeps getting larger as you increase that distance. Uh, a good way to visualize this is to imagine standing close to a wall with a flashlight on. And as you back up or increase the distance from the wall, the flashlight beam covers greater and greater amounts of that wall. Same thing here. As the distance increases between the camera and some target area and out in space, the field of view is gonna get larger. And depending on the lens, that expansion could be wide angle, meaning it could, get, it could change very rapidly, uh, or it could be a shallow angle lens or more telephoto lens, and that's going to change more shallowly or, or, or less rapidly. Um, the horizontal field of view uh, that you see here, that's going to be abbreviated as HFOV, and the vertical is going to be VFOV. Uh, then we have the instantaneous view, which, uh, as we know now, is the area that that single pixel covers. Uh, if you haven't already gotten there yet, this is all going to be the result of the detector, the lens used, and again, the distance. Uh, the formula to calculate spatial resolution is actually the Rayleigh criterion. Uh, and as you see here, it's 0.61 times the wavelength times the NA, which is the numerical aperture. Uh, don't get too hung up on that since figures like the uh, numerical aperture of a specific optic or more importantly, which wavelength should be selected for this calculation, those can be extremely difficult for an average user to identify or really anyone. Uh, most imaging companies are going to be providing you with field of view calculators like we do. Uh, with respect to wavelength, since I, since I mentioned it, you know, uh, Remember, we're working in fairly wide multiple micron wave bands compared to the few hundred nanometers in the visible space. So you really have to understand how much energy you expect to see in which specific wavelengths to properly leverage that formula. For example, there's gonna typically be more energy in the five micron wavelength versus the three, but depending on the temperature of the scene, the energy could actually creep to shorter wavelengths if you're familiar with uh, Planck's curve. That's why field of view calculators are going to be so valuable for quick assessments just based on the geometries of the system uh, of what you should expect uh, when you get out to the field or when you get to the test. So uh, here's an example. You know, we have this model A8580 uh, 1HD mid-wave IR camera. Uh, it has a detector with a 12 micron pitch and a 50 millimeter lens. Uh, the distance will say, you know, is 50 meters uh, between the camera and the heli. Uh, the resulting field of view at 50 meters, that's going to be, you know, roughly 15 by 12 uh, meters. Uh, and each pixel spot size or IFOV is 12 millimeters square. Pretty good. But is it good enough? Well, it depends on the size of the area you actually want to view or measure, doesn't it? Uh, this is really why there are different lens options, if you think about it. You need to achieve a better spatial resolution from some given distance, and your options are really to either get closer, which might not be an option, or apply a more narrow angle or telephoto lens to improve that spatial resolution uh, at that distance. So I mentioned the IFO or the, the field of view calculators, so I'd like to briefly show ours. These are located in the uh, FLIR Technical Support Center website at flir.custhelp.com that you see at the bottom of the screen there, uh, and are gonna be provided for every commercially available camera that we currently sell. Uh, you simply select one of the available, uh, you select the camera, then you select the specific lenses from a pull down uh, and enter the expected working distance, click on the calculate button. Uh, and you get your results. The tool, you know, it's going to output this table that you see here of the resulting horizontal and vertical field of views along with the IFOV or spatial resolution at the given distance in both imperial and metric units. Again, this is based on the geometries. We'll get into some caveats further down, um, uh, further along. Uh, it's going to also provide depth of field details as well. Uh, if you're not familiar with depth of field, it's, it's just how deep you can see into the image. Uh, and unfortunately, the world is not 2D. 
so this is really nice for microscopy applications. So you can tell just how you know far uh, to the between the PCB and maybe the top of a uh, component that you're going to see. Uh, if you happen to input a working distance that's outside the limits of a given lens, uh, the field of view calculator will not provide any of the output values. So it's also going to keep you honest. Uh, so let's move on and continue exploring spatial resolution and what affects it. So I talked about you know the character Cameron and being able to resolve uh, what you see there beyond being able to just subjectively resolve a scene or a target feature or phenomena, the specific need for a proper spatial resolution in scientific and engineering applications is going to land squarely on measurement accuracy. Uh, on the left here, we have an overall view of a, a printed circuit board with the guidelines representing individual pictures, pixels. Uh, since we're interested in capturing some thermal data on a specific component, uh, we decided to digitally zoom in as displayed on the right image. Uh, as we zoom in, you can see that if our IFOV or spot size was represented by those blue grid lines, a single pixel would only capture part of an element or a, a component, let's say, that we're interested in. In fact, it wouldn't even provide an image like the one that you see here within that pixel because it's going to capture all of the thermal data everything within that entire pixel and average it. Tragic, I know. Uh, unfortunately, not only uh, is this pixel fairly useless for any measurements, uh, but there's no way to even visualize the component or element uh, within it, let alone accurately measurement, uh, measure it. So uh, what are we going to do now? You know, you might be tempted to say, OK, so I just need enough spatial resolution so that at least one pixel is filled by my target, and then I'm good to go. I'm going to have an accurate measurement. But in the famous words of the respected Admiral Akbar of the Resistance, it's a trap. Well, why is it a trap? Well, you're here to learn. So rather than just provide our recommendation on a minimum number of pixels, uh, let's talk about factors that affect your spatial resolution. Uh, as they'll help provide the context. And with context, you will come to respect and obey the recommendation. Uh, who am I kidding? You're actually going to, at a minimum, take it more seriously, but I'll accept that. So the biggest factor that's affecting uh, your effective spatial resolution is gonna be diffraction. Uh, the, def the definition we have here is a, explaining that diffraction is a characteristic feature of waves in that as waves pass an obstacle, such as a gap or an edge, uh, they're going to bend. Uh, since we're talking about camera systems, I'll restate the definition that way. Uh, as light passes through an aperture, its path is affected, or rather the light going through that aperture is going to bend. So as light waves pass through the lens and the aperture of the camera, the angles of that light are going to spread. Uh, some of you may remember this image as the famous Thomas Young double slit experiment. Uh, from your high school or university physics courses. Uh, regardless, if you recall, uh, that was specifically to show the behavior of light as having properties that can best be explained as a wave or as a particle, you know, light duality and all that. Uh, and those are all depending on the specific aspect of the observation. Uh, it also highlighted the interference patterns created as the light passed through the slits. But overall, it's great visualizing how light is affected by an aperture for this uh, specific use case here. So as a general rule uh, regarding diffraction, uh, it's that it's a proportional property wherein an increase in the wavelength or decrease in the aperture size makes the diffraction effect more pronounced. Uh, likewise, a decrease in the wavelength or an increase in the aperture size makes the diffraction less pronounced. Uh, since we're talking about fairly wide wave bands of already longer wavelengths in the infrared, uh, this hopefully helps you to understand a little more as to why I said earlier that choosing the specific wavelength for that spatial resolution calculation is going to be rather difficult uh, and having a potentially large effect on the actual result. In the animation here, you see light, so, uh, light from a source traveling through a, uh, what I'll say is a large aperture versus that wavelength. Uh, in this case, you know, we'll say it's adequately large enough. Uh, versus the wavelength that the inbound light is only diffracted in some small or marginal way. Uh, unfortunately, there's no way around this. Apertures, they have edges, they're going to bend light, there's no way around it. So if we consider a constant wavelength of light or a monochromatic light source, as we decrease 
the size of that aperture you see here, the result is an increase in diffraction effects like we just explained. You know, remember these are going to be inversely proportional. Um, another point is that if the aperture was constant and we continually increase the wavelength of light passing through that aperture, we're going, you know, what would we see? Well, yes, we'd see increasing diffraction. Uh, the world isn't made up of monochromatic light sources typically, unless you're working with, you know, specific laser. Uh, but, you know, you almost always have a variety of wavelengths passing through the lens and the aperture. You know, we won't get into this here, but this is where the topic of chromatic aberration uh, and having high quality optics uh, to help correct those come into play. Basically, just as a, as a teaser here, or just a brief description, uh, as different wavelengths, you know, pass through the lens material. Remember, we're talking about very wide uh, bands of, of, of wavelengths. Um, as those pass through different lens objectives, different lens material, you know, they're already misaligned due to different indices of refraction to that material. Think about a, uh, when you see a straw and a glass of water and it looks bent, that's because of the indice of refraction in that water. Uh, that's why it looks bent like that or misaligned. Same thing happens as light passes through uh, a, a lens. Uh, due to those different indices of refraction, uh, you need to understand how those uh, wavelengths are going to propagate all the way from the world to the detector to ensure that all of those different colors or different wavelengths actually land on the detector. It's pretty cool stuff, but we need to move on. So if we continue to move to extremely small apertures, the diffraction becomes more and more extreme, as you see here. Uh, so you might be asking, well, why? Why are we doing this? Why are there different apertures in the first place? What's the point of the different apertures? For example, why does FLIR have some cameras that are f2.5, some that are f4, some with f5? Well, this is really going to uh, be the result of an overall system design choice where an engineering team designs a smaller aperture camera to support very large optics or to um, maybe uh, microscopic optics, or perhaps they design an, a larger aperture like in a bolometer system to ensure that enough light energy is able to illuminate the detector uh, and, 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 and get the data that you need or get the response that you need. Uh, another thing I'd like to call out here is that you're going to hear terms like fast and slow apertures uh, thrown around uh, if you're in the space long enough or in any kind of photography kind of thing. Uh, and if you're not familiar with those terms, a fast aperture is a larger one because it lets more light through. Uh, that's going to enable shorter exposure or integration times versus a slow aperture that's small and limits the amount of energy passing through. Now, we're going to return to the whole diffraction concept in just a moment, so don't go forgetting about it just yet. Uh, let's take a small step back, though, and have a look at how light travels from the world to an imaging detector like those found in an infrared camera. In an imaging system, you have the object plane and the imaging plane. The object plane is just the real world. So it's what you're looking at with the sensor, and speaking of the sensor, that's your imaging plane. So Real world equals object plane, camera sensor, whether it be a bolometer, a photon counter, a CMOS or CCD detector, or maybe one of Akbar's giant eyeballs. Uh, it's, the, it's, it's all the imaging plane. Uh, so light comes from the target scene, passes through the atmosphere, which by the way, it causes its own at attenuation that we're going to casually ignore for simplicity at this point uh, toward our imaging system. The light, it then goes through the lens, which can contain multiple objectives like we just talked about with respect uh, directing all the different wavelengths of light to the, to the sensor. Uh, then it goes through the camera aperture and finally to the sensor itself. Take a look around wherever you are right now. Unless you're sitting in a pitch black room with your monitor off, just listening to my voice, which I gotta say is a little bit weird, but uh, unless you're in that dark room, uh, what you see around you is the reflected light from the surfaces of whatever you're seeing. For example, when I look around, you know, I see a small uh, green uh, majesty palm tree. I see a white uh, Bluetooth speaker here, you know, et cetera. Uh, the light is going uh, through the lens of my eye and then my pupil and then hitting the rods and cones at the back of my eye. Uh, looking at the painting from earlier here on the slide on the left, I know it's made up of multiple point sources of color, each with their own wavelengths of light, but I see people, animals, trees, I see a park, um, but I can't discern individual dots. Well, why is that? Well, you might be tempted to say that my monitor resolution's terrible or that I should just move closer to the screen. 
<laughs> well, my monitor's fine. Only the very best here at Teledyne FLIR will do. <laughs> and uh, while moving closer to my screen would certainly improve my spatial resolution, my parents reminded me on several occasions as a kid that sitting so close to the TV would ruin my vision, so that's not an option. Uh, if I did move closer and I could continue to maintain focus, that's a key point, you can always move closer with an imaging system, but you will hit a limit on being able to maintain focus. If I could do that, much like our friend Cameron uh, from Ferris Bueller earlier, uh, I should be able to improve my spatial resolution, but to what end? Where, where's the limit at? And that's the question that, that really starts to, to matter. Uh, let's talk about a single point of light. Again, we'll say, you know, monochromatic light to avoid additional complexity, you know, from wavelength differences. With the exposure to super ultra high definition screens that we're all used to these days, you'd probably expect that a very small dot when viewed by a high definition imaging system is gonna appear as a dot once captured by that system. Basically that a point is a point, dot is a dot to an imaging system. But wait for it, it's a trap. <laughs> so why is this a trap? Well, you'd think that a point of light would be a point of light, but no. Uh, remember diffraction, the bending of light as it passed through an aperture, well, that has a direct effect on how the point is going to be imaged. Uh, because of diffraction, that point source of light or that dot is going to be imaged as a bright center spot surrounded by shadow artifacts of alternating light and dark patterns or rings. Uh, these rings are actually representations of that diffraction pattern. That, that is the diffraction pattern that we're seeing. I know, your mind's blown right now. Uh, the, this is called the airy disk. So if you've ever heard of airy disk, that's what we're talking about here. Um, you would think, you know, that a, that uh, that basically uh, that the airy disk is only going to be circular. And in this case, you know, for our imaging system, the airy disk is circular, and that the result, uh, and it, it's the result of those diffraction uh, rings through a circular aperture. Uh, as you can see on the right the magnitudes of the intensity or brightness are very different with the central spot being 84% of the energy in an IR system. Uh, again, this is number comes from ideal conditions, including monochromatic light and flawless optics. Uh, in the real world, this can be much different and uh, difficult to figure out in a whiteboard due to all the variables involved. Uh, but it is, you know, in an ideal state, 84% of the energy. Uh, interestingly enough, I mentioned that, you know, airy disk is circular. Um, if you had apertures of other shapes, like squares or hexagons, the resulting diffraction pattern's not going to be circular. Uh, it would actually expand outward from the edges of those shapes and would look more like stars. Uh, not exceptionally applicable here, but interesting nonetheless when you're thinking of just diffraction and trying to understand you know, how, how it plays into this space. Uh, let's consider how you know, the pattern you know, might change though. Uh, we'll go back to thinking about it as circular. You know, if we, you know, think back to the size of the, how the aperture affected the intensity of diffraction, uh, as you might have expected, the airy disk size also increases proportionally as the wavelength of light increases or the aperture size decreases. So for a given camera type, we would expect a more pronounced airy disk when using an f4 versus an, uh, an, an f2.5 camera. Uh, and the numbers are uh, maybe a little bit confusing if you're not used to uh, aperture sizes, but the larger the number, the smaller the aperture. So an f4 has a smaller aperture size than an f2.5. Since the real world, again, isn't made up of just, you know, one point source of light, you know, what happens when we consider reality or many point sources like you see here? Uh, when many of these airy disks begin overlapping, it becomes difficult for the optical system uh, to determine one from another. They effectively begin to merge. Uh, what this means in terms of imagery is that there's going to be a lack of clarity and a lack of detail on the edges of objects specifically, uh, or you may notice it as a contributor to an overall softness of the image. So what happens, uh, you know, when they get so close together? Well, this is where it becomes difficult to tell them apart from each other. You know, this is where we reach, you know, the diffraction limit of an, an imaging system. You know, remember when I couldn't resolve the dots on the painting earlier? This is the extreme of that for an imaging system. Uh, diffraction limit is the point where the two area disks, again, are no longer distinguishable from each other, like you see here. Now, you might hear about diffraction limited lenses. Um, 
A diffraction limited lens is one where the effects caused by aberrations in the ledge or in the in the lens are uh, negligible uh, compared to the effect of diffraction. Uh, therefore, the lens is only limited by diffraction, diffraction limited lenses. That's what that means. Uh, and I know it's uh, Wikipedia, but I actually like how it's stated there. Uh, due to diffraction, the smallest point to which a lens or a mirror can focus a beam of light is the size of the airy disk. Uh, even if one were able to make a perfect lens, there's still a limit to the resolution of an image created by such a lens, that limit being this diffraction. So how does this all tie together? Let's talk about detectors. Infrared detectors, as discussed in the previous webinars in the series, are made up of individual elements or, or unit cells in an array, you know, one per pixel. Uh, the distance between adjacent pixel elements is called the pixel pitch. Uh, this pitch size drastically affects how your potential and spatial resolution uh, turn out and how the airy disk or blur spot is going to be on your camera system. Uh, as long as the airy disk is much smaller than the pixel spot size, like you see here, an imaging system will operate pretty much as you might expect it to. Uh, here we see the pixel being able to fully, you know, uh, capture the thermal data from a target area. If the pixel was located uh, in the middle of a larger target area that was all the same temperature, then yes, you could certainly trust one pixel uh, source as your as your measurement. Um, and that's why it wouldn't be a trap um, and would actually uh, represent the temperature well. Now, the reason why we don't recommend using one pixel or consider it a trap for temperature measurements is that your target area is likely not a single temperature and even more so your blur spot or your airy disk size could be larger than the pixel, meaning that you're not getting all the data. Uh, to con consider this, you know, with the increasing demand for higher definition detectors, Pixel pitch, it's going to continue to get smaller and smaller for a variety of reasons. Uh, most of those are going to be related to producibility in the factory and integration into existing tooling. Uh, likewise, apertures on cameras, they're not going to be retooled for every new detector size just due to that cost, but also because then the optics that are related, we need to be redesigned and so on. So it would cascade. Uh, so what happens to our airy disk uh, when the pixel size continues to get smaller? So as the pixels continue to get smaller in size, it's gonna become more difficult to avoid the, the effects of that blur spot or the airy disk. Here on the left, we see how the point of light ends up being captured on a smaller pitch array uh, when its airy disk size is larger than those pixel sizes. We end up with the intensity spread out across multiple pixels with none of them being particularly accurate. Uh, as you move to the far right, you'll see how this could affect a larger array of pixels. And you can start to get a good comprehension of how the resulting imagery would not only be soft or lack in great detail, especially where the edges of objects are going to be concerned, but also inaccurate from a measurement perspective. So anyone familiar with optical testing is going to recognize this pattern as the US Air Force 1951 bar target. It's a standard pattern with defined sizes used to test optical systems. Uh, the resulting sinusoids from the patterns are sometimes referred to as modulation transfer functions or contrast transfer functions. In this case, we leverage the differences in the surface material, which is emissivity differences, uh, to simulate a temperature difference. And we're plotting the apparent temperature of those bars and gaps on the various, si of various sizes in the charts on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, Note that the large square in the top center of the bar chart is the red reference sinusoidal in the charts on the right. Uh, with what look like higher frequency lines being the test groups, those line profiles only look like high frequency uh, because these are again mapping the apparent temperature of the bars and the gaps, and the gaps between each bar look like lower temps, creating the highs and lows. So that's, that's what you're seeing there. Uh, as you move from the top right chart and on down, you'll see that as the bar sizes get smaller, we see that they don't report out as hot or as cold as that reference block. Uh, this shows up as a temperature inaccuracy for thermal cameras. In fact, as you get to that bottom right uh, chart that's blown up now, you see that we're really far from accurately reporting the highs and the lows. And this is because we don't have enough pixels on those targets. Uh, the, the spot size, the blur size is too big. So now we're back to why this all matters. Uh, remember, 
in this image, we were unable to read an accurate temperature because we didn't have the required level of spatial resolution to fill enough pixels with the target component. Uh, our spatial resolution was so poor that we were capturing the thermal data from everything in the pixel and averaging it out. So not only was our pixel data inaccurate, but there was absolutely no way we were going to be able to read that component. Let's say we had better resolution, but how much better does it have to be? To answer this question, let's do a quick experiment. Uh, here's a screenshot from Wikipedia showing the sizes of different surface mount components. The size ranges uh, from uh, 0805 to an 0402, and those are commonly used uh, in, in electronics today. Uh, I know it's small, but it's only going to get smaller as we move forward in time. Uh, for this experiment, let's assume that we're working with a design that's incorporating 0402 components, which is a common question we get um, because of their, uh, their commonality. <laughs> As you can see, an 0402 is only going to be one millimeter by half a millimeter in size, so, so very small. Now let's do some testing. Uh, we're going to use an entry-level FLIR camera. It's a bolometer-based system. It's the FLIR A400. Uh, it's the basis of the discussion, as well as a powered Raspberry Pi 3 uh, for an example printed circuit board and some image targets. Uh, the Raspberry Pi, it's a great test target as it's relatively small at just 86 by 58 millimeters and has many small 0402 surface mount components. And the FLIR uh, A400, it's an affordable infrared camera system. It's uh, only 320 by 240 resolution uh, uh, detector. Uh, it's a total resolution though of 76,800 measurement pixels. So while that over res overall resolution of 320 by 240 sounds abysmal compared to the, the resolutions that we talk about today in terms of you know monitors and phones and what have you, any kind of screens that we're used to looking at, uh, there's a lot of points for measurements. Um, that said, the imagery overall is still gonna look a little soft compared to higher resolution or higher sensitivity cameras like our cryo-cooled options. Uh, the A400, it also has a number of available lens options, including FLIR macro mode, which is a, a firmware option, and a 2x microscope lens. So for the first test, we use the standard 24 degree uh, lens, uh, which is going to provide a minimum focus distance of about 150 millimeters, so you have to get pretty close there. Uh, at this distance, the A400 camera is going to provide an overall field of view, 64 by 48 millimeters, uh, which is about a quarter of the entire size of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and it delivers an IFOV or a spot size of 200 micron per pixel. So now the question is how many of those 200 micron by 200 micron pixels are going to fit onto that 0402 component that's only one millimeter by half a millimeter? Well, roughly 10. Uh, with just five pixels across the long axis of the 0402 and two pixels along the short axis. Uh, this is going to allow you to see thermal differences uh, between the component and the board, but it's probably going to result in very poor data if you're trying to measure the actual temperature of the 0402 component because of the diffraction discussed earlier. We just don't have enough pixels on the target to get around that. Now let's use the uh, macro mode uh, that I mentioned earlier. Macro mode is a pretty cool firmware option in that it physically moves the detector within the camera body to adjust the optical path slightly and it improves magnification. Uh, if you've ever taken two uh, you know, uh, magnifying glasses and held them out and moved them at different distances to, to play around with the optics, it's similar to that where you're playing around with the, uh, the back working distance to improve that magnification. Uh, with macro mode enabled on the camera, uh, the working distance is going to drop. Uh, down to 60 millimeters, and the overall field of view shrinks to a 32 by 24 millimeter box. Uh, you can see that we can clearly make out the surface mount components, and we've achieved a spatial resolution of 101 micron per pixel. Uh, like before, how many of those 101 micron squares fit onto the 0402 component? Roughly 50. Uh, it's five times more than uh, just with the standard lens, so it's a, a huge improvement. And this means that you're probably getting pretty good temperature data on the 0402 components. But what can we do with a 320 by 240 bolometer? We can do a little bit better. Let's use the 2X microscope lens. With that lens, the working distance of the camera is just 18 millimeters. Uh, the overall field of view shrinks to 15 by 11 millimeters, and you can see the individual components much more clearly with our new spatial resolution of just 49 micron per pixel. Uh, 
This means for the lens and camera system selected here, you're gonna have a total of 200 pixels on that just one 0402 component. So if you wanna make temperature measurements on that size of a target, you'd be getting some great data and you'd even be able to see the thermal variations across that 0402. But what if you had even smaller components that you need to test? Well, here are three examples of what's achievable with the high performance, high definition cooled infrared camera system when paired with infrared microscope lenses. On the leftmost image, uh, we attain about 12 micron per pixel with a 1x microscope lens. Uh, and that's just a gorgeous image. Um, you can, uh, Not only uh, can we get you know better spatial resolution out of these, uh, but the imagery is actually much more crisp if you notice versus the uh, uncooled camera because of the increased sensitivity of that cryocool detector. You can learn more about that in the sensitivity uh, session that's already posted. Uh, in the middle, you know we have about four to five micron per pixel with the use of our three X lens. I really like that image. Uh, and finally, on the right, we get a little bit better with our new 5X microscope lens uh, at about three to four micron per pixel. You know, some final considerations that I'd like to mention uh, are that there are possibly broader application requirements that are also going to affect what type of camera you might ultimately end up using. Uh, perhaps you need to achieve a very small spatial resolution, but also need to maintain the largest field of view possible. That's gonna point you toward a high definition cryo-cooled you know, model with a, uh, a close-up lens. Uh, perhaps you need a portable camera system for larger area captures, uh, like looking at a server stack, uh, but you know, with the option to capture smaller components also. Uh, that might point you to a bolometer camera with macro mode, a little handheld. Uh, maybe you need to capture accurate temperatures on a target that's a few kilometers away. No. That's a trap. That one, there's a trap. This is the last one, I promise. <laughs> Long range infrared cameras and temperature measurements don't typically mesh well. Even if you had plenty of pixels on target, you just don't know the makeup of all of the columns of air between you and that target. So it, it's very challenging to know how that signal is gonna be attenuated through that atmosphere, like I mentioned at the beginning of this. Uh, the only way to know would, to have, would be to have a calibrated black body reference at that distance through that same air path. And if it's that far away, it's gotta be large enough at distance within the field of view to provide a good reference. You still need enough pixels on that target. So you might end up needing a, a, you know, a, a massive semi-truck trailer <laughs> uh, or a lorry or a lorry, whatever it is. Anyways, uh, that size. Uh, of a uh, of a black body source at that distance to be able to to see through that. So that was the last one I, I promise. Uh, and with that, that's going to end the spatial resolution webinar. Uh, I want to thank you all for attending.